Assalamualaikum everyone and thank you for joining us today. Alhamdulillah, we've got to see we have a very special guest with us joining us all the way from Islamabad, Pakistan. We have with us uh, none other than Sahil Adim, um, who I'm sure many of you out there are familiar with him and follow him on YouTube and Instagram um, with his amazing uh, talks and reminders. As well as that, um, his workshops that he does around the world, Alhamdulillah, just, uh, he's with us here in Glasgow for, uh, for the last few days. And uh, very pleased to have him here in the studio with us. So, Jazakallah khair, thank you. Very much for us. Thank you for having me. And how are you? I'm awesome. awesome. And how are you enjoying the Ryan Brew? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, it is. Positive Miami. comments, positive comments. <laughs> Just for anyone who might not know who Sahil is, um, Sahil is a, is a Muslim um, psychologist, trainer, philosopher, and Islamic speaker. He's often confused as a motivational speaker, though he rejects that label, um, and I'm going to pick him up on that one. <laughs> he holds strong views um, uh, uh, on about the global situation in terms of the politics and, and uh, it's happening around the world, and he's an academia to, um, to the very thread of the family dynamics and the upbringing of children through Islamic lens. He refuses to align to any specific sect um, and promotes Muslim unity as a collective entity. His most, significant, his most significant contribution is with the proposal of a 100-year plan aiming to revive the prophetic tradition of making the entire world a better place through Muslim youth of today. He currently serves as the CEO of Source Code Academia, uh, a, p a platform uh, offering a co comprehensive array of courses including Arabic, mathematics, biology, physics and self-improvement. These courses reflect strong elements of emotional intelligence and self-awareness through the lens of the Quran and Sunnah. Sahil had the global exposure for the uh, global exposure for the problems Muslims face due to his upbringing in Pakistan, North America, Canada, and here in Europe too. He graduated from the University of, of Chicago um, and Toronto Metropolitan University. Additionally, he had he had the opportunity to study he had the opportunity to study Quran and Arabic under um, a number of senior scholars in Saudi Arabia and in the Yemen too. So, without further ado, uh, Salva again, welcome to uh, Glasgow. Welcome to GTV. Oh God, that was all right. That was a little. Uh, <laughs> who wrote this? I don't know. I just picked up. Someone sent me. I said, "This is a, this is your introduction." Yeah, to there so was many things. If there's any connections yet, let's talk about that. Let's yeah, talk about that today as well. Um, so, through that introduction, I mean, as I said, there was a few things that came up. So, how would you? I mean best describe yourself i mean who is sahil if somebody was to ask well i'm i'm, I'm more of a you know uh, i think most muslims should be in a, in a state of how to uh, react to a global problem that muslims are suffering from even as an individual yeah. this is a global problem and i think uh, the more individuals get uh, globally aware uh, and we actually put a or a set up in a pro, uh, pertinent worldview in our kids and make sure that they start from the globe and then, you know, try and solve the local problems at wherever they are in Glasgow or Islamabad or, 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 or Melbourne for, for that matter mm. or, or Medina. Yeah. Um, unless they know and unless they, they understand how the globe moves, how, how, how these you know, bigger problems actually originate, they're not going to be able to solve it. This is, mm -hmm. this is not a Muslim problem. This is... Uh, a Muslim solution that we have. We, we have a Muslim solution and I think and I believe that we have the real solution towards the global problems. Not just for Muslims but for, for everybody. Okay. The Quran is not just for Muslims. The Quran came for all human beings. Absolutely. So I think uh, I am just another reaction to uh, to make sure our mothers and fathers understand how to look at a child sure. and, and you know project the the whole uh, productive trajectory of the first 15, 16 years after that, we won't be able to not, not, uh, do anything about it anyway. Yeah. So the, the idea of early intervention with young people and things as well. Yeah. And where did this journey all begin for you, Sahib? Where did that all begin? I mean, as a young student, where did it begin at university, earlier stage in life? Where did it begin? Yeah, actually, uh, for me, myself, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, there are no coincidences yeah. in the bigger plan of Allah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was thrown around from, from literally Anchorage, Alaska to Chicago to to Toronto to Islamabad to to you know Lahore Karachi and then you know it's I mean the first 15 16 years I, I had somehow gotten that sort of a global perspective okay. uh, and not just geographically but demographically as well 
my teachers for for, for 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 you know from far right Jordan and Yemen you know uh, to the Pakistani scholars and you know to you know you might most secular education system in yeah, America yeah, and yeah. Canada <laughs> it's yeah. like a mix of so many things going on so you know any any human being for with that kind of uh, you know diversity would naturally grasp a, a a different perspective than a guy who's just you know walking a linear path from sure. you know from you know, in any part of the world if he doesn't move around and we were made to move around because my father was moving around okay and we were just growing you so know up. for what purposes was it was the job was it is my no my father was exiled by the government he was a writer okay. yeah he oh, was a writer okay. and the Pakistani government was like you know right. what get him out and <laughs> uh, make sure he doesn't come in so when uh, Ben Nazir she she came in she brought my father back all right even okay. though my father was nine to politics yeah but he was a writer and he was a uh, he was a poet so and my father when he came back he wrote against me actually saying you you're even worse than that guy I mean I had nothing personal <laughs> against that guy yeah so yeah. we went back so it was uh, it was a you know it's an interesting mix that Quite you know me and my sibling were going through and we were, we were just uh, you know that kind of household okay. which were, which were absorbing every single aspect of whatever we could get our hands on Okay. And that's that's why you know Islam became a more prominent lifestyle even as a 13 14 year old it's it just and at that time it was not that uh what's the word uh religious clerics were not there and mm. there was no YouTube there was yeah. I mean you really had to really go to an yeah, actual library a, a you know what I'm saying? yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, absolutely it's uh it's quite a thing and you know credit goes to all marks from my father who pushed his boys to you know yeah. be around the right people to understand islam and take it seriously okay. and, and that's how it happened it's yeah. and that's where i actually think you know uh, when i look at indian and pakistanis uh the first thing i tell youth is that you have to start moving regardless of who you are you have to start moving otherwise you're not going to get a bigger pers- perspective. perspective and unless you widen your 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 gaze uh from literally from east to west you're not going to be able to understand where where to place yourself mm-hmm. otherwise you're just going to follow whatever you're going to be given and uh you're not going to be able to cl- critically think yourself out of any any kind of problem yeah. yeah and i guess that that change of environment that you had as a young person obviously is a big part of your fabric today i guess literally i mean i mean i'm just trying to relive uh those echoes which a 15 year old boy was feeling and uh, those fascinations never leave you you know because mm. you know those those pedestals are set by a teenager which yeah. we all you know trying to achieve we wither some off because of whatever adolescence we have uh, at at that age but some things stick and i i know that uh, most of the problems the muslims are facing mm. are about well, you know 2 300 years ago yeah. they were sown in really deep and uh it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to understand that we all have to come together it is not going to be solved for pakistan or glasgow or, or india or medina or 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 you know morocco or it have every event has to play its part together as a single community mm. and unless, unless there is sticking glue somewhere uh, there are enough reasons for us to just fall apart yeah and we need to find that sticking glue and uh you know this is what i call to people like you to start you know using this word that you need, you need to connect network com- community mm. family you know these are the keywords we need to build that narrative that everyone every muslim from from east to west has to understand the value of everybody else and uh, not just as a receiver but a giver uh, and uh, even if they understand the value as a receiver even that will be step one yeah because yeah. even that will be energizing everyone to come in yeah. together a single platform sure. and just get something so our parents are raising you know single families and that's a bigger problem i see in uh, you know muslims we are not single families we are part of a community and we need to hold each other's hands and we need to understand how to solve problems of brazilian muslims sitting in glasgow yeah. you know what i'm saying like literally and now we are in the age where technology has done that for us yeah. we can literally do uh more uh than you know the last 100 years combined yeah. to service this world community you know like physically and i guess that kind of falls on uh, or comes comes to my mind is 
the, the saying of the prophet, peace one of that we're like one body. One body, yeah. You know, one body, everything hurts. Everything hurts. Yeah, everything you know, hurts. Yeah, everything hurts. Um, you, you mentioned your, your father a few times there, Sahil. Um, just on that, was he one of your major role models growing up or were there other people? All in all. Well, there were so many. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, this, is, uh, this is the man, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, he died in 2001 in Chicago. But I still, I can't fathom the thought of you know writing the way he used to write mm. i mean this was this was the kind of level that he's inspired me on i mean not just me you know all of my brothers and my one sister but uh he was more of a director than the actor mm. he 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 was the agency of connection between you know between the right people and his kids and that's what a father's job is yeah. i mean you're not gonna have answers to every question you can yeah. i mean it's not, it's not possible and god forbid you have them Otherwise, he's going to lose that sense of diversity. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he, he used to get the right people to connect with his kids and uh, so that, you know, we could get the, not just the charm, mm. but uh, the correctness of the answers as well. That's the quality of this man. I think every father has to have that quality, mm -hmm. that there is no compromise in the correctness of the answers. The questions are coming from our kids. And that correctness cannot be done by one man. Mm -hmm. There is no kul ilm uh, walking around this planet. So he needs to know how to facilitate the right teachers, sure. you know, and that's that's the job. That is the job. Well, that's the job. Well, that's the job itself. And who, who else would you say? I mean, in terms of like people that we might know, you know, famous people. I mean, who would you say was would, would have been one of your role models or? Well, growing up, uh, I, I know there was this uh, guy from Jordan, Ibrahim. Is uh, his name was actually Mufti Ibrahim. He was not actually a Mufti, but his <laughs> name was Mufti Ibrahim. <laughs> He, you know, he introduced me to writers. This was the guy who made me fall in love with the books. Okay. And um, he, I mean, there are so many famous writers because they're famous. Like, uh, you know, I mean, I jumped into Ghazali because of this guy. Okay. Um, Ibn Qayyim is the guy who I think is the smartest man ever born. <laughs> I still believe, <laughs> okay, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's oh, Ibn, uh, Abu Yusuf. Uh, he's, I mean, these are the people who I actually, you know, they were brewing inside yeah. of me. But uh, later on in my late 20s, maybe early 30s, I went into a lot more of the contemporary scholarship, which is mm -hmm. going around. Um, Abu Lala Madudi became one of my, my sources of inspiration. Um, Hulana Isaac from Pakistan. Yeah. Oh my God, that guy is just yeah. pure, pure <laughs> nuclear yeah. potential. This is so amazing. It's like, it's, I call him the most delicious human being <laughs> born. <laughs> you know, he's so delicious. <laughs> uh, so you know, I mean, there's so many in uh, you know in the the North American. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's 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 so. I mean, if you're looking for them, you're gonna find people in abundance, and they're pure gold. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but my my teacher, my father had always made sure that we I mean we don't enter an echo chamber yeah we had to I mean I had to study the Dioban school with the Bareilly school with the Salafi school yeah. at all times and you know what that's how I actually train the youth now if you want to read the tafsir of the Quran open three yeah. simultaneously and not just from the same time there has to be uh, you know from from the classical era one from the, the your current era and one from the current era but not from your geographic location yeah. So that you can get that perspective, and that's the triangle you start, yeah. you know, you start your, your tafsir uh, from. And um, that's how it uh, happened for me. It works so well because you cannot just get the sense of tafsir, but the sense of or contextualize the argument of the, the mm -hmm. how he structures the argument around any concept. Uh, and then you can see the counter as well, the quality of the counter. Mm -hmm. So this is how I, I was raised into, you know, understanding the basis of Islam. And I think every, every boy, and you know what? Most of the parents are complaining that, you know, kids are not jumping into tafsir and hadith yeah. and sirah. Yeah. Because, you know, this one line is a little too boring as well. Yeah. You know, you just have to close your eyes and follow. That's not, literally not <coughs> Islam. You need to give him that challenge. And as, do, as soon as he's going to start comparing, it's going to be, you know, uh, that much more exciting. Excellent. True. And, and, and that focus on the youth that you have and that passion that you have towards young people, because um, I guess it's that thing where we have to invest in, in, in you know, 
educate our young people to an extent where the goal, I, I, I'm assuming, and I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they're able to stand on their own two feet. Would that be the reason why, or the purpose why you do so much work for the young people? Not just to stand on their own two feet, but to make sure that, you know, the next few generations wouldn't have to put that kind of effort just mm. to get up on their feet. Mm. You know what I'm saying? We have not been given enough time to spend knowledge because we were not, we were not stabilized two, three generations ago. If our generations were politically and financially stable, yeah. we would have been a lot more knowledgeable. We, we are too busy in trying to make ends meet. A lot more advanced as well. No? Yeah, it's literally, yeah. Great. And I mean, that's just an add-on, advancement, progress, and growth. I mean, we, we, most of the Muslim nations are literally on the brink of survival. Yeah. So we need to have that sort of a competence in any field that we jump into so that, you know, our kids or ideally us, would be giving our kids enough time to just stay inside the books and libraries. But we know, I know why would they? Because, you know, men's got to eat. Yeah. And that, and they, they and, you know, they got to feed their families. So that's what I said yesterday to people in Glasgow here as well, that, you know, you want to do two, two jobs, three jobs, it's okay. Just do them. But make sure you do them really well. Yeah. Because I need one generation to sacrifice their time and effort and blood, sweat and money so that the next one wouldn't. And I wouldn't want any generation to have that sort of a, you know, dilemma to face. But now we are in that sort of a situation. Yeah. So if you're migrating to Western countries, then you got to know what the price is. And the price is you. One full generation has to, you know, go yeah. through the wall and that the first man to the wall is going to be bloody. And I respect and I think that's very honorable that, you know, we migrate and, you know, we spend enough time and we sacrifice ourselves, our time and our luxury, you know. But our kids would actually grow and prosper into, you know, stronger, more competent people who would really know what they're talking about. And they would substantiate any kind of claim that they, mm. that they make as a Muslim. Right now, Muslim kids, they talk, they, they write, they argue, but there's no substance behind them because yeah. they're not, not put, putting enough time into, you know, doing their homework. So I, I don't like Muslim kids as teenagers having to work to feed their families. It's, yeah. this, that's not why you migrated. Okay, that's not why, that's not the purpose of migration. And even if you are, but that's the, that should be the end of it. You know what I'm saying? To so go immerse yourself fully. True, true that. Um, and, and also in regards to young people as well, one of the things that um, you know people come to, and I'm sure you know, yesterday's event was about you know the, the the thing at home for young people. How should how should the parents be? You know, in terms of in that process of bringing up the young person in their home, what's what do you think is the main part main element that, or the main factor they should bring into consideration when it comes to bringing up young people, especially in that youth uh, early intervention. Is it time? Because we always talk about quality time, spend quality time with uh, your children. Um, but on one hand, you're saying it's fine to go, go to a job, do this, but where does, how, does that, how does that balance out? No, I'm talking about men here. Well, the first seven, eight years. See, uh, the Muslim woman is gifted that the uh, divine literature is not forcing her to move around and just make ends meet. Mm. That's the gift of a Muslim woman. Because we now know through common sense that we need a dedicated mother. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the Quran is forcing a dedicated motherhood. And that is, that's twice the responsibility on the man. That if he needs his child to have a dedicated mother, and no one else can actually do the job because only your know, biological yeah. biological mother will, will be able to do that. No nannies, no you know daycares are going to suffer for this sort of. Thing. <laughs> so if you need a child to grow, you need a dedicated mother for that child to grow really well. Yeah. And for that, I'm saying, you know what, you want to invest in your fully. You got to do two or three jobs. It's all right. That's the price you got to pay for that child to actually have that sort of a nurse, that sort of a facilitator, that sort of an administrator mm. as a as a mother. Now I know that ideally it shouldn't be. But that's the kind of situation we're in right now. In ideal situations, there should be a father, mother, and the triangle should be complete mm -hmm. where there's, a, you know, nurturing, development, growth, you know, the, the whole IQ should be built by both the parents. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we can't even talk about these sort of things inside the Muslim-dominated yeah. areas, let alone, you know, where they're immigrants and they're trying to survive. So try and understand as a man, you're not just going to have babies. You're going to have to have a very clear model as to how to give that child a dedicated mother. For that, you telling him, you need to do twice the job. A little job, like two jobs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's that sort of a decision. If you, you want to make that decision, you take the plunge. Okay, yeah, okay, apply for that immigration. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, uh, the priority is the children. Yeah. The next generation is the priority, regardless of whether you're in Glasgow or Islamabad or Delhi. Your job is to make sure that the next generation is fully confident and he's got enough IQ and enough EQ. And that can only be given by both the parents. Either one of them will be able to, you know, do the mm. job properly. So this is, this is more of a, you know, one first filial dilemma which any immigration or diaspora is going to suffer or, 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 you know, experience. Experience, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's that thing, you know, and, and I'm sure you get this again a lot, Sah, in terms of, you know, the, everything's in place at home. You know, mum's playing her, her role, father's playing their role, but you've also got the environment that they live in so that's always a big factor in that as well because they're they're spending eight nine hours at schools education they're spending a few hours maybe here there so there's you know and obviously social media and various other factors so i mean there's a lot of things that go into play there so how what advice would you give in terms of parents you know looking at that they can do everything they can and it's that other thing also sorry just to add on to that it's like you know, one child's absolutely fine. Then the next child, you know, son two or son three or daughter one or daughter two is a different ball game altogether. Yeah, you know? It's like a don't give a breed. <laughs> so, I mean, what what would you say to that? Well, you know, that's, that's something which, uh, you know, it's called the course of ignorance in psychology. You know, most mm. people don't even know what they're going to go into when they're going to yeah. go into this. Because this is invisible enemy, you know, comes from the cell phones, the school system itself is designed around building philosophies. We just don't see it, so we can't we can't estimate the, the damage. That's one more reason why you, as a man, should really know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Okay, because now there is no help. There is no help. And most of uh, the Muslim women are not equipped to da- to 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 uh, you know, tackle the you know the pressure, the whole education system, the the new laws and policies, the whole you know wave of public policy is going to. I mean, I haven't even experienced the, the worst yet, yeah. and we can't even you know tackle the first wave of of the big problems that you know we as uh, our kids are facing. They're asking real questions because they're getting those kind of thoughts processes developed inside schools and classmates and whatnot. So, can we quarantine? No, we cannot quarantine our no, kids. No, it's not possible. I mean, it's a conscious choice you make. <laughs> no, the fact that if people didn't even know what that choice was, yeah. that's the real problem. That man is the enemy. <laughs> he didn't even know what he was getting his kids into. So, people who know what the, the problem is and then they still are making that conscious choice, then, you know, they better understand how to, you know, develop Three times a Muslim inside a single child, because he he would need that sort of a you know, a skin that sort of a guard, so that he could un- take the blow, yeah. and not just take the blow but tackle it really well. Otherwise, he's not going to be able to survive because he can't just say Allah walk but and you know solve a problem. Problem people will be like you know we need solid arguments, buddy. Yeah. And it's not just the fact that you have real arguments. You need a really well structured political strategy to actually create a public po- or influence a public policy, let alone create one. And so, it's it's not just in Glasgow. It's in Toronto. It's in it's in New York. It's yeah. in uh, you know in South America. It's it's actually it's in Pakistan and India as well. So you need that sort of competence uh, from a father, particularly the 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 burden is on the man, so that he is going to make a decision whether he wants this sort of a family unit, mm-hmm. and where do you want that family unit? Okay, and it's not just the, the the Scottish policy or the influence of the West on Scotland or vice versa. It is the man's influence on his own, you know, kids, and that's something which is 
not just going to come through books. Mm. Can't just, you know, load a child with books. You read them. Otherwise, they're going to take you. It's not, it's, it's not, that's not how it works. You're going to have to build so much competence. And quite frankly, here's the ar- irony. The irony is that even if you were in dead center Saudi Arab, Mecca, you would still have to have this sort of an exposure to a child, which a regular glass go child is going through or is receiving from school or the environment so that the Muslim mind is developed to counter these sort of things for the future. Yeah. You can't just hire kids in, you know, Islam body basements and think, you know what, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> Nothing's going to be fine. This tide starts from here and it becomes a big snowball and comes mm-hmm. down to India, Pakistan. In the next 20, 30 years, uh, you know, our kids would be literally not even aware of how non-Muslim the thought process is mm-hmm. at the base. So I think there's more potential in Muslim, conscious Muslims living in, you know, in the West so that they tackle the, the first wave, <clears throat> tell us how to, you know, how it felt, mm-hmm. and what's the damage, so that we can actually raise babies yeah. uh, with thicker skin. And a better IQ and some more deeper arguments and, you know, well-structured thought. Because, you know, this is, your you're the first row facing the, the, the wind. Do you, do, do you think that we can, uh, with, uh, with our children, do you think we're overprotective, monoculture That's too much? No, no. You, you see, as a Muslim woman, and uh, any minority is overprotective. It's mm-hmm. not just the Muslim. Muslim in the West will, of course, there are just 4 million Muslims in England. Yeah. I mean, they have to be overprotective because the yeah. immigrants are naturally a little more superstitious than the regular yeah. Joe. Yeah. So they're going to be 10 times more overprotective. You know, you see helicopter moms of philosophy as well. It's like, you know, why, why did you, you know, say that or why are you thinking on those lines? Even the child isn't even, you know, she's actually putting bad ideas in yeah. the, 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 the children. So it's, it's natural. But... I, I see how kids are immune to not being Muslims in by their thought, immune, literally, mm-hmm. versus the overprotective parents. And that's a bigger problem. Yeah. If it's, you're so overprotective and still your kids are, you know, uh, atheistically uh, driving their lives in, in little micro decisions, then what's the point of being that o- overprotective? Superstition is not going to get you anything. No. Literally, if anything, it's going to get your kids farther away from your own philosophy because you're not backing it up by, you know, logic and, and, and deeper, you know, processed thought. So I think it's, it's twice the responsibility and uh, the way we have structured the concept of Islam. I'll tell you, that's the problem. Mm. The way we have structured Islam as a concept and presenting it to the child, he's not... It's so wrong when he says this is this is not going to solve any of my problems. Mm. Okay, you that, need to change the way you look that, at it. That was kind of going to be my next question. Was about that relationship that pe- children develop, and we all develop, an experience that we have with Islam is usually through a masjid or a mosque. And I'm probably getting into trouble for this question, but do you think the mosques are playing their roles? Well, we better get in trouble for this because, you know, we got you know, we got to set the record straight. I think the masjid is the cause. The current definition of the way masjid is structured is the cause. Okay. See, Stru- masjid is... Structure in the sense of... Well, they have divorced politics. Mm. Okay. Like, literally, they have literally made sure that the child... And you know what? No, no one else has divorced politics. The child is not divorced politics. He's going to be affected one way or the other. Sure, sure. And he's naturally going to have to bow down to the, you know, the power of wherever he is. Mm-hmm. Be it Jeddah or Glasgow. Politics, politics. That is why you know we are d- designed to be in politics. Mm-hmm. Rather, we are designed to you know take the power and exert it for the better good as well. I mean, mm-hmm. so it's not mm-hmm. that you know it's anti-Islam. It is pure Islam, and we actually go towards the power because we are the only people who can handle it because we have a book backing it up. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're not going to take it, don't blame anybody else taking it, taking yeah. over, and just using it on you. I mean, that's just natural. It is, it is, it is just simple math. And kids are doing that math, and mommies and daddies are not. Much yeah. is not. If anything, much is like, you know what? And you know what? I don't really understand. I can understand if the Arabian countries are letting their kids not, I mean, they're forcing the kids not to be. In it. But in the West, 
Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? The masjid in England and in, in Scotland should have been 10 times more active. Mm. I mean, it's not like you're living, living under a Muslim ruler. Oh, well, I'm gonna, it's yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. it's going to be Quruj. This is democracy. You have to play with the instruments they're giving yeah. you. And they have, uh, Victoria, I think, has given Muslims the biggest gift. She established the platform 100 years, yeah. really well, you know, well placed it, and s- set a lot of things right. That gave enough sense to anybody who's living, born and raised here to understand how power works, mm. how the power structures itself, and yeah. where are the power structures, how to use those. It's like a chess player. Yeah. I think I, that's why I'm way more hopeful for Muslim kids overseas in the mm. Western countries than people, uh, Muslim, than kids who are going up in, uh, in the Arabian and, you know, the, the Desi lands. Muslim countries, yeah. 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 And so that, I mean, with, with that in terms of, you know, institutes, not just mosques, but general institutes as well, uh, how how much of a role do they should play in terms of... They should literally the family, be called. Not just the child, but the family structure as well. Because obviously, when we talk about family or communities, the social problems, the social issues that we have. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, as first of all, as a community, we're very good at hiding things under the carpet, you know, taboo <laughs> subjects, these kind of things. Everybody does that. Yeah. You don't um, have a solution. So how do we... You still have okay. No, yeah, I'll tell you. Anyone okay. who does not have a solution is gonna, you know, yeah. shove it under the carpet. Absolutely. And he's gonna be stepping and that, on and it. That's that's really sometimes, and what I see that is to be sometimes is a cry for help. It the is. people are actually well they're asking this question yeah. because the they're, they're they're you know I'm here. I need something. I, I need your attention. Whatever that may be, time. You know, I just a little bit of advice or whatever it may be. But yeah. No, I'll tell you. You know, let's just not divorce common sense when you're talking about any kind of problems. And uh, the common sense thing is that unless there is a political establishment of the community, then any kind of social problem is national. You mean you're asking for it? Yeah. yeah. So all the Muslims in the planet, wherever they are, I mean, they're really good in what one, you know, one story, which is a moral uh, application of, of uh, Islam uh, yeah. on the individual. Yeah. And that's a job well done. Yeah. They have the literature. <coughs> they have examples as well. I mean, the Muslim imams are doing really good. In yeah. of, they're structuring their personal life. They're setting good examples. Not even 1% of them get caught, because they're not into it, in doing any kind of ill in the society. Mm. That means, you know, the Muslim does purify or whatever responsibility that it gives to yeah. the, the individual. But it's not working as a community. The people who go pray Juma do not go to the same Muslim praying Asr. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's the failure of the Muslim right there. That means there's something not working. So unless we have a structure, which is very clear, I'm going to give you the solution right there. Every masjid should be connected globally, as, at least in the West. At least in the West. And I'm just talking about the school of thought. Yeah. That's another um, fact. Yeah, I'm <laughs> talking about, because, let's just call a masjid a parliament house for just this session. Okay. All of a sudden, the imam's role becomes pivotal in the, in the neighborhood. Like literally, he yeah. has to act like the local councillor running the council in glass. We have councils here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and th- he literally has to make the rulings as, as you know, in, 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 in those micro decisions as yeah. well. And he has to pick out all those competent Ever people. Since the yeah. Exactly. So, this must be, was supposed to act like a little tiny little parliament. With two, three, four, five, six houses, not just the two houses, which yeah. you know the English kids, you know, so that many kids would be involved as teenagers, and responsibility should have been given by the masjid imam to the kids that you know you're going to be intervening in these sort of matters. It's not just volunteer mission; it's Islamic missions mm-hmm. for the neighborhood. I mean, how hard is this to, to 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 achieve? It can be done on weekly, literally weekly basis, because all the neighborhood has to attend the Friday prayer anyway. It can become a town hall. And we never treat Masjid Juma, uh, the Friday prayer, as a town hall. No. We just have this little, you know, written sermon. We just have to recycle it every single time. And everyone knows that everybody comes to the Friday prayer just to get out of this, you know, masjid. Mm. As soon as the masjid, you know, the prayer ends, everyone runs mm-hmm. because there's no attraction there. You know, this is... This is where the solution is. Masjid has the solution. That's why, you know what, last year I started the campaign that the masjid has fallen. Like literally. I mean, that's the meaning of the word. Yeah. I mean, you need, our kids are going to, we have to resurrect the masjid. 
And if you don't, if somebody, they're not going to do that. Yeah. Someone else will, and they're not going to be calling it masjid. Yeah. And they're not going to have any Islam in there. They're going to have same the same instruments. It will be on a neighborhood level. It will be on a teenage level. They will be, you know, empowering our teenagers. And naturally, our teenagers are going to run towards. Yeah. It's like the fight yeah. piper thing. Whoever takes over the, the first mover advantage. Yeah. So we might as well just do it right now. Yeah, we need to get a house in order very much. Very Our much. house in order. It's like literally, <laughs> yeah, both houses in yeah, order. Both houses in order, yeah, true, true. Um, something you said at the start, I wanted to pick up on it, uh, Salabai, was about the, you, your idea of, of you know, fix, fixing or, or looking things at globally, then kind of working at the local level. Yeah, if you do not have a global philosophy, you're going to have a local disorder of the psychology. Okay. That's what I call it. If you're right. not globally exposed. If you can think of that a bit more, expand that for us. Yeah, yeah. Like, that if, I, if I do not know what's going on in the, the bigger discussion, the university mm. campuses in America, yeah. I won't be able to make any kind of social movement in Pakistan. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because I know where it comes from. It's, it's basic psychology. That, you know, whoever is building the primary, I mean, we, we are under the prevalent thought of somebody. Mm. And that's not a Muslim thought. I mean, it's not take a rocket scientist to know that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most of the Muslims all. are under a Muslim thought. Because the masjid is not creating thought leaders. We are actually literally designed to not think. Because if our six, last six, five hundred years, training is on fiqh. Fiqh is lawyership. Lawyers are trained not to think. Mm. But Quran doesn't just have fiqh. It has hikmah. Yeah. It has the thought. You know, all of our sahabas yeah. were thought leaders. Like literally all of them. You can't even find an exception that, you know what, this guy was just, you know, saying, since Ali bin Abi Talib said that I'm going to follow it. No, sahabi didn't think like this. But we are trained to say, yeah, because I was trained by Shafi'is. Yeah. So since Imam Shafi'i said that, but my teacher was like, you know what, unless you can prove Shafi'is right, you cannot follow him. Yeah. I mean, that's the exact reverse cycle. Yeah. So lawyers are not going to do thought leadership. And as Muslims, we're trained to be lawyers. And so much so that we can actually, you know, any lawyer would have to take up a case, right? Yeah. So we're taking up cases against Muslims. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? And most of those cases, even if we win those cases, we're going to lose as a nation. Yeah. So somebody else has been winning this case, which is not a Muslim, on how to think, what to think about, where is progress, where it should be checked the next hundred years. And those were never Muslims in the last six, seven hundred years. Because masjid is not making us mm. think. And even if they were making us think, we were thinking about how more of a Muslim I am than my, my next door neighbor who is a Muslim. Because he just happen, happens to be a Salafi or a Shia yeah. or a Sunni. I mean, it doesn't take a, you know, a rocket scientist to, to, to understand what I'm saying. We, we, we have confined ourselves into little clusters as lawyers who are always trying to prove how right we are in about in, in our belief system mm -hmm. and there is not even a single muslim who's even thinking about what is the biggest problem on the globe and how to solve it and where is the force to so, to you know construct that kind of a solution muslims are not thinking on those lines and mind you non muslims are mm -hmm. okay and i don't blame our kids to be attracted towards you know all of those schools which are talking about the bigger problems true sure. True, and 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 from that, I mean, one of one of the things uh, again about influence and about you know role models and things. One of the things that we, you know, I'm sure it's quite current, is about this whole idea of um, you know identity, knowing who you are, um, and a lot of young people get confused with that idea um, because of uh, again, at home it's a certain culture and tradition. In school is a different culture and tradition, you know, where somewhere else it's something, something else. Or perhaps, you know, when they're watching things on social media, you know, influenced by people like, um, I don't know, Andrew Tate or people like that, you know, who's now Muslim, you know. It's very confusing, all these things, very confusing. I mean, where, where, what advice would you give to young people when it comes to these kind of things of where knowing your identity, knowing who you are? See, I, I think... Quran actually gives a spectrum of emotional structures so that parents can pick up whichever is relevant at the time or the area. So just saying La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, or, you know, making him believe that there is one God and the last Prophet is the, you know, the, is our story. That's, that's not going to cut it for the 
current day Muslim. People like Andrew Tate or whoever is representing whatever he's representing, even if it's not in the name of Islam, or in this case, he's a Muslim in the mm-hmm. name of Islam, becomes attractive because it does call for the definition of the identity, yeah. re-identifying themselves. Yeah. And Quran actually says, kulli. That should have been the identity of the current day Muslim yeah. because somebody else played that game and they won it really well. You know, kulli is the American dream. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just an individual American dream, it is an American imperial dream as well. It was the Victorian dream as well. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So that should have been the Muslim identity. And that's so much so attractive that you know you can fit a million billion annuitates there and still they wouldn't suffer for use here awala kulli. So we need to have that sort of a power. And for that kind of power, we need to have that kind of responsibility given to a you know a Muslim individual. And first of all, how is he gonna get that power? He's gonna have that kind of competence, that kind of IQ, that kind of intellectual acumen. And Muslims don't even harbor that. By the way, our intellectual Muslims are borrowing that intellect from non-Muslims, non-Muslims right now. Yeah, that's the and hats off to those non-Muslims because, you know, they are still working on, you know, yeah. uh, that, that acumen, that raw human acumen that we as human Muslims were never barred or banned from. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We had the Quran and we had the, we, had, we could have set the precedence, but we followed precedence. Okay, well, but somebody's going to set it and human beings are designed to follow this presence. So power has to be within the Muslim uh, mind. Then it's going to come into the Muslim clusters. And then those clusters are going to, you know, retain or control that or maintain that power. And since we didn't, no, they're doing it. So I can keep talking about, you know, the Second World War and the post-war aftermath, which we are naturally, you know, suffering from. And, you know, oh, we can talk about it. But that's not, that's not the, that's a symptom of a problem. The solution lies, lies inside how a father is treating the son. Mm. That's it. If enough fathers would know what I'm talking about, they would put those standards of competence and keep failing their kids until their kids really claw themselves up on those ladders mm. and become that competent. And you know, you pick out an intellectual right now from any part of the world. He's going to be influenced by a non-Muslim scholar right now. This, this is the irony. Yeah. Well, what kind of, you know, wings was he born with? Nothing. There were standards and the powerful set the standards and the people mimic those powerful people who have, who represents knowledge or the standards of knowledge. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to make, uh, you know, I re- keep reiterating or regurgitating the same point. I hope every mother knows what I'm talking about. But we as human beings, let alone Muslim or, or any believer, we need our Kids competent. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying anything which mommies and daddies shouldn't be shouldn't be drooling over right now. That yeah, I need the most powerful son or daughter in terms of intellectual acumen. Mm-hmm. Why are we not creating or setting the precedence of intellect, intellect right now? And if Muslims can do that, <coughs> everyone's going to be running towards the, the Quran. Mm-hmm. And we keep complaining about oh, we now we don't have enough adherence to our own book. And that's why non-Muslims are repulsed from, you know, yeah. from our book because we don't adhere to the Quran. Well, no one's going to adhere to any book unless that book is functioning as the primary power or source of power uh, for, the, for the bigger part of the community. We are not in power no matter where we are from, you know, east to west, from Australia to Alaska. Muslims are always, or wherever you see, in the last three, four hundred years, the weakest community is going to be for Muslims. So why would anyone adhere to the Quran? You know, yeah, true. I don't blame them for not adhering to the Quran because we're de- we've changed. It's like we've restructured ourselves into you know isolated individuals who are going to look good in terms of character, but we'll not really use any bits of that character when it comes down to exerting it for you know for li yuzi And in in regards to again upbringing, I mean one of the one of the golden rules that some people are. That you hear a lot about is the saying of uh, Ali about the the seven 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 years of nurturing and loving yeah. seven years of um, discipline and then his final seven years friendship. of friendship yeah. friending your 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 child. Have you seen? I mean, perfect uh, psychology. Perfect psychology. Yeah. I mean, the current day psychology yeah. now says it right, yeah, literally. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's 
But see, before the 777, mm -hmm. you need to set the purpose straight. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's one. That's and then 777. <laughs> Just one, get one purpose straight. Yeah. You know, why, why are, what, what, what do you see when the whole 777 is going to yeah. uh, be achieved? Once you have that 21st year of your best friend who's living your dream as, you know, which you have as a father, your son is actually, your daughter is through that course. What is he achieving and why? That's what I want the parents to, to you know, come together and first of all, lock it down. That, you know what? Uh, unless we set the, you know, the prism straight, uh, this this could be the biggest problem as well because yeah. that creates the perfect copy of you yeah. know whoever the father is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we do not need copies of our you know this sort of philosophy that we got. We need to keep uh, in mind that we need people, uh, kids who are going to challenge it. And I'm telling you this right now. Uh, I'm not talking in abstractism or I'm just talking about little specifics. You need to tell the kids that Muslims should be calling the shots on every single public and private matters of the human beings. If they cannot do that in their own lands, no one's going to start to believe them or take their word in their lands. So we need a working model. And that working model ideally should have come from a Muslim place. But I'm telling you this right now, uh, the Western Muslims can slipstream. Yeah. And uh, if they know how to slipstream, from their own culture, they can actually use the Quran. So I, I have still have hope. Of course, they're going to both go hand in hand. Yeah. But, you know, kids in Glasgow naturally. And I've tested it yesterday. Plus, kids in Glasgow are way over the curve compared to any Pakistani is, is living oh. in lower Islamabad. So that's the gift. Use it. But you know what? More intelligent the child is, the more problems you're going to have if you're not well yeah, set yeah. in your philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, you know, true. dumb children are not going to challenge your philosophy. Intelligent kids are. Yeah. And that's their job. If they cannot challenge or you know, conquer his own father, should, how are they going to conquer Scotland? I, I think they should be encouraged to in fact do it more. Yeah, more yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, time is getting the better for Just a couple of more questions. Um, now, uh, just just on, on, on the Quran and the Hadith, I mean, your favorite surah of Quran and why? Oh, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Oh, my God. There's so much to play with there. It's about the time. Okay. It's about the problem. Okay. If you if you're suffering from a bigger <laughs> problem, you'll see which surah is you know yeah. going to you know, become your 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 weapon, or whatever time that you're in right now, in terms well, of your well, emotional. Let, let me ask you then. Let me ask you that. What is the surah then that gives you you know you're having a bad day? Oh no no! I'll tell you. You're uh, having a bad day. And you want something? I live in Pakistan. That verse or that surah. Can I live in Pakistan. You yeah. Uh, <laughs> you you have a bad day just about every other. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, surah is too big of a word for a Muslim because yeah. it says so much in every surah. But I, I know that one ayah okay. keeps me going, uh, which is Hal Jazawul Ihsani Illa Lisan. This keeps me going at the worst of the worst days, the worst of the worst moments. This is the fuel that is going to pick you. Pick it. It's, it's, this this I can you know raise a dead man. Hal Jazawul Ihsani Illa Lisan. That. I mean, it's just self-explanatory. I hope everybody, I mean, I'm going to start crying if I explain this. This is, uh, this is the way Allah sees uh, the standards of how a human being should be looking at mm. anything, especially other human beings. You know, the deed that is done upon you. It's yeah. like, oh my God. Oh my God. It's, it's, uh, can there be any other, can there be any other reward for an Esan then the Hassan that was done on you. I mean, it's like, uh, I, I, my, my whole life philosophy, you know, pivots around this, this one. I, I, and whenever I read any kind of philosophers, be it Hume or Descartes or, you know, I, I just, I just cannot see how, how else to ground myself mm -hmm. as to, you know, the biggest anchor, the mightiest of those anchors becomes this ayah. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I'm, st I'm still, I'm still feeling so bad by just picking one ayah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm left, I'm leaving so much, yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. know, but, uh, 
it's this is the one that that just I just can't get get this out of my 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 heart and head. Any given second, you're gonna you know take an MRI. This eye is yeah. gonna be like top of the <laughs> top of the list. There's gonna be so much more, but this eye is gonna be like. <laughs> and amongst the the, the companions of the Sabar Rasul. Oh, it is a journey. Your, oh, awesome question. It's a journey. Who's, who's your favorite? Uh, <laughs> it, and why? The, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, the companions. Uh, I mean, and, and mommy should listen to this, okay? Because okay. the way you're going to structure that 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 archetype, or no, that caricature okay. of the the sahabi, that's where your child's whole life journey, at least for decades. Because you know, I I plotted one day a few years ago of what kind of influence I had. And what kind of life aspirations I was generating, because this is a source of energy. Mm. And I found out that it was a companion, one companion that was causing that sort of, you know, uh, movement inside me. So I started with just like any other child with Omar Khattab. Any boy who reads enough about Omar Khattab. By the way, I was trained on Omar Khattab. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like a, you know a whole series of you know projects and tasks and lectures. And this is where my my, my Yemeni teacher comes in. This guy was all about Omar Khattab. So I started off with Umar Khattab, and then I went into uh, Salman Farsi because hmm. somehow I kind of you know start you know every child I am Salman Farsi because yeah. I'm going to teacher to teacher to teacher, yeah. and then uh, I went into Abu Dhabi. Okay. You know, in the later part, because I was going to a lot at that point. I remember because you know you 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 reminisce, yeah. and I was reminiscing. So I was thinking this is what's going on, and I still believe that there's still a, a lot more of Abu Dhabi Farsi's you know element. Uh, that influence I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. That that influence had a lot more element and just just keep lighting the fire. But then I went into Saad bin Maz. That as soon as I went into youth, I I was speaking about describing Saad bin Maz, uh, the standard that Saad bin Maz set so much so that Prophet Sallam became uh, expressive about putting him as a benchmark. Mm. And Sahabas were like. How can we achieve this benchmark? Yeah. You know, I can I can quote you some hadith where Prophet Sallam is talking about if, for example, the grave is going to grab you, and is going to um, squeeze any and every human being that's going to enter the grave, even if it is Sahabi Maf. I mean, it's like when the Prophet Sallam benchmarks you yeah. as a name. It's like, what yeah. else can you possibly achieve in this universe? Look yeah. at the resume of this guy, and then there was this. This caravan that just came in with the cloth, and everyone was running about. Because, you know, the cloth was so fine that even the Prophet you know, praised it. And then once he he held the cloth, uh, he said, "This is the finest cloth I've ever." Because he was a merchant himself. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. said, "This is the finest he cloth I've ever stuff, yeah. uh, held." But you know what? This is not even compared to a handkerchief. You know, which Sadin Mal is holding right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when you read this, plus you know, I'm not talking about Sadin Mal because of these two, three, four ahadiths. But whatever the journey that he took. A nine-year-old Muslim, which means nine years ago, old, uh, nine years ago, he was not even a Muslim. In the nine years, he achieved whatever he achieved, and then came Ali bin Abi Talib. And in my age, I think um, Ali bin Abi Talib stands tall. Now I've gone through that transition, knowledge and courage, uh, the epitome <coughs> of knowledge, the epitome of loyalty to the Prophet Islam, the brother, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can't replace this or these with anything. Everything else with all this hobby he's got can combine, accumulatively cannot hold the weight of, you know, you are my brother here and you are my brother there. Uh, I just, what else can you actually ask for? You are, oh, Ali, you are my brother here in this world and you are my brother in the hereafter. What else do you want? What else do you want? I mean, it, it just tops it up. Uh, any hobby would give his life for this hadith, you know. This this so uh, Ali bin Abi Talib is the current, you know, uh, so nuclear reactor sitting inside me right now. The last few years. <laughs> so from Omar al Khattab to uh, Salman Farsi to Abu Dhabi Rafai to Ali bin Abi Talib. This is I've been like in my visible journey because there's there's uh, so many questions that I, a boy would be thinking. You know, why just these four? I mean, this, these were teachers. Yeah. Okay, these the are teachers the teachers. Are, right. yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. For sure, for Plus sure. Plus the worldview actually calls for a sahabi. That the best part of a sahabi is that, you know, if you have him defined really well, the current worldview that you have, you can get a solution out of this mm. this one, one you know. Because we are imitating, we're, Im- we're mimicking the character of that hero that we ever ever, ever make uh, as, as boys and, you know, girls. Sure. And what, what final advice would you give to, um, what final advice would you give to parents? I mean, 
as, as you said in your introduction, you know, you know the West, you know the East, um, alhamdulillah, you're global that way. What advice would you say would you give to families here in the West, particularly? Not just the West, but uh, the West can do it really well. The West can do well. The positives and negatives, in terms of positives, what, 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 what are they good at? What are they doing that they should yeah. do more of? Good and question. what's the negative that they need to kind of work on? What would you say it would be? Well, uh, a Western parent, a uh, father or a mother. Okay, I'm just going to talk about a parent because, you know, just to get a general answer. Uh, first, get the, the standards right. Okay, the standards of Islam right. A standard means, you know, that uh, element that you're actually trying to train your or amplify inside the minds of your children has to have a solution to the problem that child is going to go through. Mm. Okay. So the standard of Pakistan, India, or wherever you came from, or, or Morocco, or Tunisia, or, you know, wherever, the kind of Islam that actually lives or brews in the minds of scholars there, that's relevant for those areas. And they are doing it by design. That worldview works. But in Glasgow, your kids are not going to be able to relate to, you know, those sort of spikes in the, yeah. you know, importance. There is a spike in the importance of, you know, what is the element of Islam that I, I, I really must adhere to, never give up on that. And it's not just about not drinking or, you know, no adultery or no fornication or no girls or this. This is, this is basic. I'm talking about, you know, raising the bar, yeah. standards, you know. So thought leadership, uh, political acumen, con uh, sense of community. Okay, Sense of community can only be given to a Western Muslim. We cannot even get that sense of community in Pakistan or Morocco because mm. we're born inside a community. We're going to yeah. take it for granted. Here, yeah, this child is going to understand the power of a community because he's going to actually need that power. In Pakistan, I don't need the power of a community. I am in the community. <laughs> I have problems from coming from the community. <laughs> in Glasgow, yeah. I'm not going to get problems coming from Muslim. I'm going to be getting problems from everybody. And a Muslim's first job should be as a mother, raise him as a giver. Because if he's going to be the first giver, everyone's going to become a giver. Okay? Givers produce givers. Yeah. We start thinking as a minority, and every minority thinks like that. If I'm raising my son or daughter as a giver, people are going to misuse it and, you know, take advantage. You take advantage of it. No, they're not. The best thing about the giver is he is going to be producing givers because people are going to fall in love with him. We all love the givers. They never, you know... You know, created those selfish, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, elements. It's actually, they, on the contrary, they actually inspired us to become givers. I'm talking about anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. Mm. So if you can actually do that for the first 10, 15 years of your son or daughter, you're going to find out that if you are raising him as a member of a community, not as an individual, you should be testing your son or daughter that what kind of a uh, community servant is he and what kind of a test that you can actually design to see whether he's failing or passing on that test. It's very simple. Okay. So, and, and he should be a missionary here. And he better understand that, you know what, he's a nobody alone and he's everybody uh, combined. So these are the sort of, and plus I'm talking about, you know, the, let's go through the first hour of this, of what kind of problem is going to solve. He better be a thinker. He better be thinking because if he's got the sense of community, naturally he's going to be thinking about the solutions of the problems of the community. Because if he's not a member of the community, he's going to be thinking about problems about which are or his own problems, or at best case, his mom, either daddy, the family problems. And most of the Muslims are doing that right now. So make sure he's thinking about 2 billion Muslims. And he's initially, make sure he's thinking about all the Muslims of Glasgow. First, he's going to solve the problems of, you know, Muslim community in Glasgow. Naturally, he's going to be taking that, you know, up a notch by talking about European Muslims and then the global Muslims. Mm. Only a member of the community is going to solve the problems of uh, the world, regardless of what kind of religion he has. <laughs> we, we cannot expect individuals, selfish, self-centered philosophies to, you know, to help anybody else other than their own selves. Mm. So I, I guess it's that thing of Know, know the issues, know the problems. No, that's the, be the, 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 yeah, that's, knows them. that's the underlining yeah. factor here. Yeah. Know the issues and work according to yeah. that in terms of solving The solutions the are going to come on his own. Yeah. But if he, he's not even looking for the problems, how, how can he even expect that he's the guy, the guy who's going to solve them? <laughs> so I mean, at school, I'm talking about middle school, test your child whether he's concerned, whether he's actually looking for, you know, what kind of, uh, how many, you know, kids, 
how many Muslim kids are there in the school and, you know, what kind of problems uh, are, are, are Muslims or kids facing in general. Is, is the mommy's job to make the child think on certain lines. Mm. You create those lines and he's going to follow those lines. And later on, he's going to be drawing his own lines and his own literal artwork over, over that campus. Yeah, you're going to yeah, be sure. And, and just to kind of, uh, kind of add on to that a question, maybe is that, do you think uh, then our expectations are quite high for our children, too high? Do we set the standard too much? Oh my God, no, on the contrary. We have on the contrary. literally found, no, okay. we are raising insects here. Right. We're not even raising, they're just crawling. See, unless it's global, it's not Muslim. Okay. At least not in this day and age. If it's not a global solution he's thinking of, he's not Muslim. So expectations to be global. Yeah, at least, at least, not just global right now, in the next hundred years as well. Yeah. See, if you aim at the tree, you know, it's when my, I was raised by the Irish, okay? <laughs> Literally in school, I, I went into common. My, it was my, my sister Patricia. I remember I was in grade two when she told me this, and I'm going to tell you right now, that she said, son, if you aim for the tree, you might not cross the, the, cross the tree, but if you aim for the sky, you'll definitely cross the tree. So Muslims should be thinking global, not just the current problem of the globe right now, but the problems now and the problems which are going to come in the next two, three, four generations. That's the least a Muslim has to think on. And by the way, there are a lot of non-Muslims who are already thinking on those lines and solving those problems as well. So if you're not going to do that, uh, our kids are going to go towards you know those realms which are going to be very attractive. And that's one of the things, I mean, particularly, I mean, I have a young family as well, sort of thing. So you always think about the Islam in the next 20, 30 years. What is, what is it going to look like in Glasgow and Scotland? You know, what's yeah. this? Well, we what's can see. What's going to look like? You know, it's one of those. I got a little things. glimpse yesterday about what's right, going to okay, look like in 20 years. Allah. Not looking good. Okay. No, no, let's, let's give us some good news. <laughs> no, well, is it our kids are going to actually, you know, inshallah, hold the fort. Inshallah. If, you, if you're not going to train them right now, yeah. why, how dare we think they're going to hold the fort? Yeah. And not just hold the fort, raise it, you know, and and enhance the, the and, you know, get more people in, like literally. And make it so attractive and open that people want to be in and stay in. True, true. Um, so we have to finish it there, yeah. unfortunately. But yeah. Jazakallah Khair, thank Bye. you very much for your time. Well, thank you for really having me. Really appreciate your time here in Glasgow. And we hope for the rest of the journey. I know you're going down to London after this. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, tonight, morning. in fact, tomorrow yeah. morning. So it's, uh, so it's no, no rest for the weekend. No, no, no. This is not. Yeah, <laughs> but this is no. But inshallah, in your travels and remembers on your du'as, inshallah. You too. And you too, inshallah. Um, all safe, inshallah, all well, inshallah. Thank Jazakal you so much, Barakallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for watching, everyone, inshallah. And uh, we'll see you again very, very soon. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.